Hello, my friend and friends. If ever you look up CSS specificity, uh, you're bound to find an animated GIF of Peter Griffin fighting with a set of lines, because it's one of those things that can tend to frustrate people a little bit. And the cascade in general is one of those things that people don't particularly always like with how CSS works and think that maybe there'd be better ways of it working, but we're sort of stuck with it. And to a certain extent, I can see why those frustrations happen. And there's even a lot of solutions that come up to try and remove certain parts of the cascade away. And this has even led to a lot of different solutions being out there that try and remove parts of the cascade from being what we have to actually worry about. But I would caution against those just because once you realize the power of the cascade uh, and what it can do, it can actually mean that you write a lot less CSS and more maintainable CSS along the way because it's actually a lot more flexible than people give it credit for. And we even have a lot of modern CSS solutions these days to help make it more manageable. So this video is sort of a crash course in modern approaches and strategies that we can use to make the cascade work for you instead of against you. And we're also going to be looking at how we can debug issues that we do run into along the way as well. And I am going to be starting with the basics of the cascade and all of that and sort of slowly step our way up into a lot more modern solutions along the way. So if you're relatively new to CSS, the entire video might be good for you. If you're only looking for certain specific things, I have time stamped everything, or if ever you want to come back to the video to find sort of that one thing that you forgot how it worked or whatever it is, timestamps are all down below if you do want to jump to a specific section. So the first thing we're going to do is take a look at this example. And what we're going to be looking at is how the cascade evaluates and decides what styles to apply where. Uh, and the first thing to know is that well, the word cascade there actually means something because what it does is it's going to look through the CSS file from top to bottom, so sort of cascade its way down through our file. And while it's doing this, it's going to find selectors that match an element and then it's going to take the last one that applies to it. So even though here I've put a font size of 1.25 rem, my font size is quite a bit bigger here because we have this font size right there of 1.75 rem coming instead. And because it's the same selector for both of them, the second one wins. So the order is important with the one that's lower down always winning. And it's a very simple equation here. It goes the body and the body are both equal to one another. So the second one wins. And of course this can happen where they're both also on the, in the, the same area as well, where, whoops, <laughs> the, the second one will win. So if I take this and I move it down, the second one is winning. And if I move it back up, the second one is still winning. So <laughs> whichever one comes second will win. Uh, and this is one of those things that obviously you will never do this intentionally or probably very rarely do this intentionally because there's actually a use case for this type of thing that we're going to explore a little bit later. But because you generally won't do this intentionally, it can be really annoying when it happens. And so I do quickly want to look at how you can debug this. So let's go back to how I had it before where we had it uh, down here on a second declaration. And I'm going to right click in here and choose inspect to open up my dev tools. And if we look in the dev tools here, if I have my paragraph selected uh, and it could be on anything, my font size is being inherited uh, right now, which is another part of how everything works. And inheritance is a little bit of a different topic, though it is part of sort of the core of CSS. But you can see here, I have my body set to my font size 1.75 rem. And if I look down here, I have the 1.25 that's being crossed out. Now, unlike how we write our CSS where the rule at the bottom wins, the dev tools show us the rules that are winning first if there's things lower down that are being overridden. So if you see something like this and you go, that's not the font size I set on there then you can look down and go, yeah, that's the font size I set. And in this case, I'm using a code pen. So it's just saying style like this. But if you have an actual CSS file and you're using VS code, it will actually show you the line that your code is coming from. So that can also help you out and go, oh, I made a mistake there because I declared it in a lower down section or whatever it is. Uh, and then it's easy enough to just go and delete that or change it or whatever it is. And there's actually another uh, choice that you can have here as well, um, or not choice, but there's another solution. <laughs> Sometimes in VS Code uh, and other code editors will they'll show you if you make a mistake, but this is a little bit more limited in how it works because if you have two separate selectors, it's not going to show us. So if we had this type of mistake where I have my body here and then my body here, your code editor won't know that's actually a mistake because it might think that you're doing it on purpose because it's two separate selectors. But in the situation where you might do something all within one selector, so if I look here, this is all inside my header. If I come in my header, I already have a padding here, but I have all these other things going on and I might forget about that along the way. And I might come down here and say padding and I just want it to be, I don't know, two RAM or something. 
And VS Code is actually highlighting this as an error for me because it sees one selector with the same property being declared two different times and it knows that's probably not intentional. Again, sometimes you might do this on purpose, but a lot of the time you won't, especially if they're separated like this, because it generally just means you forgot that you declared one higher up in your selector. Now, if for some reason you're not getting this underline like this, you can just do a control comma, or if you're on a Mac, there'd be a command comma to open up your settings. And in the search right there, I'm just gonna search for CSS lint. Uh, and that's gonna bring up all the different linting things that you can have for CSS, which is when it highlights syntax errors generally. And if I go down a little bit here, you can see right there, there is the duplicate properties and I can have it give me a warning. So you can choose ignore, warning, or error. And I personally just like having it as a warning because as I said, I do sometimes use this on purpose. So I don't want it to cause an error, but I do want it to warn me just in case it's something I don't intentionally do. Now, there's another important thing that goes on when we're declaring things uh, within this. And this is a really good thing, though some people that come from more of a computer science background don't particularly like it. Uh, but it's if you ever have a declaration that's invalid, where in other languages, if you have something that's invalid, it just generally breaks that thing from actually working, whereas CSS just kind of keeps on trucking. So let's come in here and we're going to do a font size in here of Scooby-Doo. Uh, Scooby-Doo, where are you, right? So we have a Scooby-Doo font size there, which is clearly invalid. We can't do that. Um, so if I come and I take a look once again in my dev tools and we go and look what's happening in here, so I have my paragraph, there's my body, and you can see the font size here, Scooby-Doo, with a big exclamation point right there. And I love this <laughs> because it tells me this, unlike here where everything was valid, right? My font size 1.25 rem that was there, there's nothing wrong with it. So there's no error, there's nothing going on in the dev tool, but it's just saying this isn't being applied because something else is overwriting it. Whereas with the Scooby-Doo, it's saying this isn't working because there's an error and I can see what that error is. And in this case, it's an invalid property value. Uh, you could also have a typo within your font size or something like that. And Scooby-Doo is obviously a very silly example of the type of typo you might make but there's lots of times where you might misspell a value for something and you just don't see the typo. It happens to all of us all the time. So it's just a nice way to be like, wait, that why is that invalid? And then you see the typo for it. So when it comes across something like that and it goes, well, this is an invalid value, then it just goes, well, I'm gonna go up to the last value that was valid and use that one instead. And actually this leads us to what I wanted to talk about when it comes to how we can actually use this in an effective way uh, and do it on purpose where you might wanna put two different values. And in a sense, it's sort of a defensive way that we can write some CSS uh, or maybe a progressive enhancement way of doing it. And my example here is I have this site here, which is uh, my awesome site with viewport height. And what I've done here, and we'll look at some code for this in a second, but in this area here, I've set the entire height to 100 VH, which is 100 viewport height to make it fit. And I have this part at the bottom that I always wanna be visible. And even if I'm in my responsive mode here, you can see as I move around, uh, it's always working in the responsive mode. If you open your dev tools, it's this little icon right here. So if I turn that off, it goes to regular, I turn it back on. Um, so people always ask me about this when I'm using it. So the little icon there in Chrome, Firefox has one on the other side uh, and Safari has their own version of it as well. But you can see that as I move that around, it's always sticking on the bottom. The problem is that's not actually how this would work on a phone. So here I've opened the same site on my phone and you can see part of the text there at the bottom is actually missing. And that's because of my header at the top over here uh, it's not the header, but like where the URL goes, that little UI element there is actually making the viewport 100 viewport height, but it's starting lower down. And then if I scroll a little bit, it's sort of fixing it because now I actually get that at 100 viewport height there. And this is a really annoying and it happens on all phones that this problem happens. But we, then we can solve this by using other units like DVH or SVH. So here I've just switched over to the SVH version and you can see that even though the address bar is here at the top, that we have the entire important message here at the bottom working. And if we go over on this version of it here, you can see the same thing. I can switch over and it still functions here. The problem with SVH is browser support isn't perfect for it, even though it solves my problem. But we can use that and leverage CSS in a good way here where here's sort of my simplified example of what we were just looking at, where I have this header with the min height of 100 BH. And ideally that's what I want, but to ensure that everything works properly, what I can actually do here is do a min height of 100 SVH and rely on most browsers using this one. Because again, which one is the browser going to use? It's going to use the last one that it comes across. 
But if a browser doesn't recognize this one right here, instead of using that declaration, it goes, well, this is invalid. I don't know what an SVH is because I'm an old browser and I don't support this feature. I'm gonna go and find the last declaration that is using a min height that has a valid value, in which case it will fall back to this instead of having no fallback at all, and then the header completely shrinks away. So this is a very easy way to add features that may have not the best browser support where it's just a single declaration. You just declare an older one that's maybe not quite as good, but then you can follow that up with a more modern approach that does exactly what you want it to. Now this next little tip doesn't really necessarily fit into the cascade, but it does fit into this idea that we sort of talked about here, and it also fits into using modern CSS. So I do want to talk about it really quickly. Uh, which is just at supports, where if ever you have something, and you can see here I have this navigation that's right there, and when I scroll down, then at one point it comes in and it looks different and I've changed the styling of it. I recently did a video on this, so if you'd like to check out that video, there's a card popping up right now for it. But with this, I created this with CSS only, but the problem there is browser support is not perfect for this. Uh, and in fact, right now it's Chrome only, and I didn't want my navigation to be completely broken on other browsers. So what I did is I included a lot of that inside of this at supports here. So it means the browser is gonna come down, it's gonna use all of these styles here, and then if it supports an animation timeline, it gets a whole bunch of new things. And I'm actually overwriting my top right there. So again, I'm using the order, but only if this feature is supported. So if we're on a different browser than Chrome, what would happen is you would just get a normal navigation. There we go, it kicked in a normal sticky nav that just stays at the top uh, and functions just fine. But if you are on a browser that supports this and as more browsers gain support for it, more and more people will get this new and improved version of it. And then now we get the, the second one like we saw right at the beginning. So we're still relying on the order of things and the order that we're going in. And then if we're supporting something, we can add new things to what we're doing, all right? Or, and overwrite other features like my top here along the way. So order still does come into this. You wouldn't put a supports before you would put other things, just like you wouldn't put a media query before you put your regular declaration. The same type of idea here because we want our media query to overwrite other styles a lot of the time. So we rely on on the order of things, and I'm doing exactly that same thing right here. And I'm not gonna deep dive supports, but if you do want more information on it, there is a link in the description on a video that dives into a deeper examples of how you can use it. But the main purpose for at supports is really if you have a lot of declarations that you wanna you know, make sure are working, if you have a single declaration or a single value that you want, this type of method, in my opinion, works really well, and there's no reason to have to use the at supports in situations like this one. And that was a lot of talk just on the order that things come in, but it shows how important that side of things is. But there's a lot more than just the order, obviously. But the other big one is specificity. And that's where every selector that we have has a priority. Uh, and part of that is if they have the same priority, then the order comes in, but there's other ways to make selectors more important. And understanding specificity is one of the most important things to know about if you are writing a lot of CSS. And I actually covered it in a lot of detail in an older video, but it's still a really good video where I go into exactly how it all works. So if you do wanna deep dive the topic a bit more, there is a card popping up once again for that video. Uh, though in this one now, I'm going to go into a few just simple examples to remind you. I'm gonna assume that you have the basics down, but we'll do a quick refresher on just how it works. But then we're also gonna look once again at how we can debug issues with it, as well as how modern CSS plays into it because there's a lot of different things with modern CSS that sort of throw a wrinkle into how specificity is calculated. So let's jump on over to this example right here. And you'll see here, I have three different paragraphs that are set up. The first one has a class and an ID on it. The second one has the same class, but no ID. And the third one is just a regular old paragraph. And if I come and look at my styling here, I have my intro, I have my text, and I have my paragraph. And I put them in this order on purpose to show that intro is actually winning, right? So on this first paragraph where I have it, it is a paragraph, it is, it, it, my text also works here, and the intro is here, and the intro is the one that's winning right now, even though it's the first one. So the order here isn't being applied. And the reason for that is, 
IDs have the highest level of specificity. And you can think of it a little bit like how you weigh things. IDs are the, have the heaviest weight, classes are second, paragraphs are third. And of course we have pseudo selectors and pseudo elements that also come into this game as well. And again, I'm not gonna go deep into this right now because I had that other video that I mentioned, but you could have a hundred class selectors on something, a single ID will still overwrite it. And you could have a thousand element selectors and a single class would overwrite that one. So IDs always will win over classes and classes will always win over paragraphs. And then you can also apply, th though of course you could also have things that are the same as like p.myText in which case I have an element selector and a class selector. So that's gonna be higher specificity uh, than just the class selector on its own. And I'm not gonna look at this right now uh, with this example, but it's just to say that you can combine different selectors and that will have an impact on the specificity as well. And before we look into some of the modern things we can do with this, I just wanna look at this example here because once again, if we go into our dev tools and dev tools are always like, if you have any problems, something's not working, always open up your dev tools and see what's going on. Uh, and you can see here I have the intro, my text and paragraph all right there. But if I go in here and I hover over the P and so whatever your selector is, as long as you're hovering over that selector, it's going to show you what the specificity of that selector is. So we can see that it is zero, zero, one. If I go on my text, it will be a zero, one, zero. And if we go onto the intro here, one, zero, zero. And again, these are separate things. So you could have a hundred class selectors on something, which I wouldn't recommend, but you could, and it would just be zero, one hundred, zero, which is why a single ID would overwrite whatever you do for your classes. Once again, it's showing us the order that these are going in and it's going, well, I had a paragraph. I'm not using that because this class selector is overwriting it. And I'm not using this class one because my intro is overwriting it. And the order of them doesn't matter because of the specificity of the selectors that are there. So if ever there's something weird, and this is definitely where if you have like a hover class coming in on something, the hover does influence your specificity. So sometimes you don't realize that or there's something weird that's going on. This can be a nice way to go, oh, I didn't realize that had an impact on specificity. And you see it here and you might understand why a selector is winning over another one. But as I said, I wanna look more at the modern things that we have uh, that can impact specificity, namely the is, has, where, and not pseudo selectors that we have and how they impact specificity because it's not super obvious all the time how they're actually working. Uh, when it comes to the specificity at the very least, um, where is kind of obvious, but the other ones, they might not be quite what you expect them to be. So we're gonna look at that now, but the one thing I just wanna say really quickly is I'm not really gonna do a deep dive on is, has, where, and all of that. I just wanna sort of look at their impacts on specificity, even though we'll get an idea of how they work. But if you do want a deep dive on those, as you might've guessed, there is a card popping up and I'll put a link in the description to a video where I go into a lot more detail on how they work. But looking at this quickly, I have my is selector here and I have an H1, H2, H3, and this does have a specificity of 001. So it only has the specificity of an element selector. Uh, this is really important because some people assume that because this is a pseudo class, that it's actually going to have specificity on its own. It does not have any. And we just saw before how if we do like a hover, it's the same with a focus, other pseudo classes like that, they do act as a class when it comes to the level of specificity. But any of your pseudo selectors that have parentheses, so is, has, where, not, uh, all of those, on their own don't actually contribute to specificity. Where the specificity comes into things is where we have the elements inside of the parentheses and those do contribute towards it. So in this case, it's looking at this and goes, all of these are element selectors. Now I'm not gonna count all three of them, but we only have element selectors in here. So I'm gonna count this as a specificity as one because that's the highest that we have within these parentheses. That's very different from the where down here. And where is the easiest one to understand because where is like the sibling of is. And both of these just allow us to group selectors together. But what's important with where is there's zero specificity at all. So anything you put in here, it doesn't matter what it is, an ID, a class, anything, go crazy. Anything within those parentheses will count as zero specificity. So that can right away be very useful. If you need to write a selector, that normally would have higher specificity, but that higher specificity could potentially cause some problems down the road, you can use where to remove that specificity from the selector and that can solve your problem. Uh, is, on the other hand, it does contribute to it. So that's why my orange red is winning over my color blue here. Now I'm gonna also take a look at our not here. So not works in the same way as the is, where if I have a selector, the not doesn't contribute to it. 
but the P that's in here does. You can see I've said not, not P, so it's selecting all my headings because uh, that's all I have on this page and it's changing their color. Once again, this and this have the same specificity, so they're evaluated equally, they have the same weight, so that means the one that's lower down is going to win. So order is still important even when we're dealing with specificity, because if you have equal specificity, then the order wins. Now where things get more interesting here though isn't when you have these single classes or even you know, lists of classes like we have here, it's when we bring other selectors into the mix. So if I come down here on this one and I say is H1, H2, H3 ID, I can actually use that to boost my specificity on this selector. Uh, and it's sort of artificially doing it. My ID here isn't looking at anything on the page. This could just be like random, but it sees that there's an ID in here. So it's choosing the highest specificity of any of the selectors in here to apply it to this entire rule. So if we come and take a look on this heading one, and you know, let's change, we have orange red for both of these, so I'm just gonna make this one yellow, um, just so we can see that it's different. And we'll do an inspect on there. And when I do that, once again, our dev tools help us out. So you can see that my H1, H2 is being overwritten, my khaki is being overwritten, and then this one is winning. And if I hover on top, we can see that the specificity is the 100, which is all coming from that random ID that I've placed in there. Now, normally I wouldn't suggest doing something like this, but it is good to know because I'm sure many people who are listening to this have worked with some sort of CMS or something like WordPress, or maybe even something with an older version of Bootstrap. Um, where you're trying to overwrite something that actually has some pretty high specificity going on. There's like this weird selector and you wanna be able to overwrite it. This could be a way of doing it without having to rely on important, though it's still pretty heavy handed uh, and might actually cause more confusion than important would. So I would be careful with it, but it is a potential way that you could boost the specificity of something. Um, and you could also use it, like I've seen people that have to string together multiple classes just to create a higher specificity selector for something to overwrite something else somewhere. So this could be one way that you could overcome it again without having to rely on using important. And this is the same thing with our not selector. So uh, as long as you have an ID that's inside of those parentheses, the same is going to apply there. And all of these same things are also going to work if we have a has selector as well. So here um, I've just quickly put this example together where we have a few different things going on, but I have my is with an ID selector in there just to boost specificity uh, on my heading. So we can see that's overwriting this one. So once again, the order isn't important if one of them has higher specificity. So higher specificity will win, equal specificity, then the order comes into play. Then I have my P span of orange red here. And then I'm using the where, and if you remember where means zero specificity. So my P span is this one right here. We can see that it is orange red. And so here I'm using my where, and even though I have that random ID in there, the light green isn't working because my where means zero specificity. And it's also not working because I made a typo in there. <laughs> so let's fix that before everybody calls me out and says that's the reason that it's not working. Uh, so if I take off this light blue, um, we should see that the entire paragraph has changed to the light green. But as soon as I just come in here, even though this is a single element selector on here, the light blue is working. So where it just removes any form of specificity and the same rules with our IDs and everything also applies to our has selector as well. Um, the has selector, I'm not gonna deep dive it now, but we're basically saying if my paragraph has a span, this paragraph has a span, so it's changing. These two down here don't have spans in them, so their colors aren't changing. Once again, if you'd like more information, I did talk about the has in that video that I mentioned before where I explain how it works. But the general thing to remember here, even if you're not really into the world of where it is and has and not yet, and you haven't explored that yet, it's just to remember that if you have any pseudo selector that also has parentheses in it, the pseudo selector itself, the is or the has or the not or the where does not affect the specificity. It's only what's inside of those selectors that counts. In all of those, it's only taking the highest specificity selector out of all of them and it's applying that to everything that is part of that selector. So that's sort of the key thing to remember, of course, except for our where selector, because that just means no specificity at all. So that was a lot right there. <laughs> and we're gonna get into the next layer of things, pun intended, because we're gonna talk about layers, um, because we've seen how order affects things and how specificity affects things. 
And we can actually get more control over all of this now as well, because we can actually create our own layers within our CSS files. And these layers can be helpful for organizing things, but they actually have a very big impact on the order and they have a very big impact on how specificity works as well. So you wanna have a good understanding of those before you really get into the world of layers, just as a little bit of a warning. Uh, but let's dive into it now and see how layers do work. So here I have a simple example set up where I just have some text with you know paragraphs in there. Uh, and I have a regular body, I have an H1, and then down here I have a layer and another layer. And so layer is an at rule. Uh, you might've seen them at the bottom of a few of the demos that I was doing up until now as well. And basically you can say at layer and then give your layer a name. So I have my way less important layer first, and then you probably have some other code and other stuff going on. And then you might have my a much more important layer coming after that. And right now, this one is the one that's winning. And you might be saying, Kevin, of course this one is winning. We have the same uh, selector for both of them. So the specificity of both of these is equal. So then order comes into play and the second one will win. But let's let's try something here. I'm gonna come and let's move this down and we're gonna add an ID here. ID is equal to, uh, let's call it test. So we're gonna use it for testing purposes. And let's come on this first one here. We're gonna switch this one over to my test. And as you might guess, this one here is going to change, but it doesn't. Wait, what? Why, why isn't it changing? The reason it's not changing is because this layer here is still winning. That's weird, right? Because I have an ID, which should always be higher specificity. So it should be winning, even though this is coming after it, because this is just a lowly element selector. Ah, but layers change the game in how everything works because the specificity of this is scoped to this layer only. So all the rules in here are going to be evaluated against each other. So if I had, let's just say here, I did a P and it's color purple, um, and we'll take off my test here. Let's just do a P here, a P there, and let's remove this one for the moment. We'll comment it out. You can see that this, the font size is coming from here, and then my color purple is coming from this one as you'd guess. And then if I came and I did my test on this first one, test, this, these rules will apply to the first one here, and then this color purple will apply to those two here. This makes perfect sense, right? Because the ID gets this styles, the regular paragraphs get those other ones. So this is this little self-encapsulated area where all of the specificity rules and the order and all of that are being applied. But as soon as we go outside of that layer, none of that matters anymore. <laughs> if there's another layer, because this is gonna reevaluate all these rules and all of its own things over here. And because this layer is second, this layer is more important. It can be a little bit weird at the beginning. There's a lot of very good use cases for this. But before we get into those, I just wanna show you how we can see this in our dev tools, because once again, they do help us, where you can see here, my ID is being overwritten <laughs> by what's happening here, even though we can see a high specificity on this one, and we can see the low specificity on that one right there. The other thing it is showing here though, is that we have layers. And if I click on any of those layers, or we can click on this little toggle here, and it will open up the CSS layer panel, and it says implicit outer layer, we'll talk about that in a second. But then we have my zero, way less important layer, my number one, my super important layer. And the order here, and the numbering that's gonna go on these, is the order of importance of these. So zero is the least important, then we'd have a one, a two, a three, a four. It's gonna keep count of all the different layers you have, and it's gonna show us the order they're put in. So any selector in this layer is gonna overwrite any selector in this layer if they match the same element. It doesn't matter what the specificity of anything in this layer is, if the same thing is being styled in this layer, this layer is always going to win. And CSS layers have been around for a while now. They were actually introduced in 2022, but they're hitting about 95% browser support as I'm recording this. So I'm actually excited because I think we're gonna start seeing a lot more people using layers and we're gonna start seeing them out in the wild. Uh, it's probably starting right about now um, in bigger and bigger projects. So it's definitely something to keep your eye on. There are a few other important things to understand with layers though. Uh, one thing is I'm going to change the name of these just to make life a little bit easier. So this will be my layer one and this will be my layer two. Uh, and one thing we can do with layers, because right now they're working the same way, but I can actually come all the way at the top and I can define my layers up here. So I can say at layers, 
uh, sorry, at layer singular, not plural. And then I can do one, two, and everything's gonna work the same way it was working before. What's happening here though, is I'm defining the order. And then over here, I'm placing things into my layers. Why that's important is if I put two first, and then we put one second, it's going to switch the order of them. Because my we're saying that two is coming first. I guess the naming now is actually kind of terrible and I shouldn't have used two and one, but we're saying everything in layer two is less important than everything in layer one because layer two comes before layer one. So now layer one has become my more important layer. And to me, this is useful because you define all your layers and then you can place things in your layers lower down in your CSS and not worry too much about the order that things are coming in as long as you know which layer they're going in and the order of all of your layers along the way. And of course, you probably wouldn't name your layers to one and stuff like that. Where I see layers coming in um, that could be useful is you probably do like a, uh, you'd probably do something actually like third party. <laughs> so say you had like bootstrap or something like that that you're importing, you could import that, then you could do a reset, then you could have your base styles, then you could have your layout and you could create layers where you know everything's gonna win and at the very end utilities would probably come uh, at the end there because your utilities would be the one that's most important and you wanted to like overwrite other things. And the nice thing about doing it like this would be the third party ones would be the least important. So even if you're using some third party thing like Bootstrap or some other framework that's a little bit heavy handed at times, and this could even be on an existing project where you're just like, okay, I just wanna shove all of that off into its own layer now because then if ever you need to overwrite something, you could do it with an element selector. And of course, this means you do need to be careful. There's implications in what that could actually potentially mean, but it does make it a lot easier to work with things where there might be, you know, you don't wanna be so heavy handed, or this could be really useful if you're updating a code base where you could put all of your older code into a sort of a low specificity layer, you know, one of the early layers, and then the new things that you're working on could come into a higher layer, and the benefit there is you wouldn't be worried, like if you did some bad practice in that old code of yours, it's easy to make those updates because you, even if you went kind of crazy, you'd be fine, except if you used important. Because <laughs> important gets flipped on its head. And to show you what I mean by that, let's come here and <laughs> we'll go back to my one, two, just to use the actual code that we have here. Uh, and we're gonna see that this caused problems. <laughs> so if I go and we use important here, uh, let's do, this is an ID selector, it's super important. So I come on my font size and we say important. You can see that it's actually winning now. So we've, we've raised the importance of that. As you might guess, important always sort of, this is the winning one. So my font size is now winning. And then you go in this layer and you go, ah, I'm gonna overwrite that. And you put important here and it doesn't work. Important is actually flipped on its head when we use layers and you might go, Kevin, this is super weird, but this happens because layers aren't new to CSS. They're just new that we can create author controlled layers. We've always had three layers. We've had the user agent styles, which I'm sure you're familiar with. We have the user styles, which, you know, as a user, you it's not so much, it's not so common these days, but you can inject styles uh, into your browser. And then you also have the author styles, which are our own. and so it always goes like the user styles would overwrite the user agent. And then of course our own styles, the, the person writing the CSS here would overwrite the user styles, but they enabled it. So if a user uses important, that would take precedence over everything else. So if a user puts important on something, the author, us writing CSS can't overwrite that's user styles. And if a user agent style sheet uses important, it will actually be impossible to overwrite. And you might be saying, when would you ever see that? There are actually a few important declarations in the user agent styles. I'll give you a little challenge of going to find what they are. Uh, there's not a ton, but they do exist and there's good reasons for them being in there. But yeah, when we're coming into here, important acts counterintuitively, let's say. And it, I think in my own opinion, it's just more of a reason to completely avoid using important <laughs> um, on anything we do, because it just would get very confusing very quickly. Uh, and the last thing I wanna say is before we get into the next subject is I have a layer one here, a layer two here, and let's just come up here and put a P of a color of orange red. And this is actually going to win, <laughs> even though it's not in a layer. And you actually got a little bit of a hint of that coming in before, because if I do my inspect here and we look in here again, you remember I said we'd come back to it, where if I go into those styles, we have the implicit outer layer, then our one and our two here, and they're numbered zero, then the one, and then our two goes here. So anything that's not in a layer has higher precedence than anything that is inside of a layer. 
So that's why you might just want to have a single layer for all the easy to overwrite stuff. And then you just have your own styles after that. We don't have to get complicated in how you use layers, but it is important to know that if something is outside of a layer, it has the highest precedence. Then we go through all of our layers in the order that we've declared them. And as you can see, <laughs> we have lots of tools that we can use to help us with specificity and dealing with the cascade. Uh, and I do think there's an added complexity to all of this that we're going to have to sort of get used to using. And if you're new to CSS and you're watching this right now, don't overthink it. Don't overdo it because definitely that could happen. But there is one more thing that is going to have a big impact on how people write their CSS and on everything we're looking at right now, uh, which we're going to dive into next. It's browser, it is relatively new. Browser supports just below 70%, but it is in Chromium browsers and it was just added to Safari very recently in 17.4. So it was the time of recording, but I'll put a um, browser support table for it linked in the description because if you're watching this in the future, it might be useful uh, to know. Because as I said, right now, we probably don't want to do it unless you're just experimenting with it. But not too long from now, you might actually be seeing this in code bases. So I do want to cover it because it's going to, as I said, change how we do things a little bit. Uh, but yeah, just before I get into it, I do want to say don't be overwhelmed if you're new because a lot of this is these extra tools we're doing. And I'm really doing this as an overview of what all of these are. It's not a deep dive into each of the specific topics, but I just want to make people aware of all of these new modern features that we have that can help us deal with the cascade and all of that. If you're relatively new, stick with the basics and slowly maybe experiment with one of these at a time. Wrap your mind around how it works, how it impacts things, how you like to work with it, and then you go and add the next thing to your repertoire along the way from there. But yeah, here's the last one. It's one that I'm actually very excited about, which is scope. <laughs> and scope is something that people have wanted in CSS for a while. Uh, I wasn't ever sure if it would actually come, but it's here now. Uh, and there's some interesting things that we can do with it. I'm not going to be deep diving it right now either. It's something that I'm still experimenting with. And we've had variations of this with, you know, the scoped CSS in different ways with JS frameworks like Astro and Vue. Uh, and there's been other things in React that sort of have a similar way of working. Scope in CSS sort of has that idea where we can scope stuff to an element, but it also has a little bit more as usual when we add something as a native CSS feature, it's a little bit more powerful because it's the browser itself that's interpreting it. So here's a, a bit of a simple example where I have this navigation at the top and I can't see my, my button <laughs> very well. And the reason I can't see that is if we come here and look at my button itself, I have some coloring on here um, and normally I would be able to see my text, but I have this primary navigation A selector right here and that has the color white on it. So let's turn that white off and then you can see my, my subscribe button is now working. <laughs> it's there, I can see it, there's no problem. But when I say primary navigation A, we're boosting our specificity because we have a class selector and an element selector. So that's overwriting the styles on my regular button here. And that's kind of annoying. And actually I just realized I don't even have a, let's just see color black here. So we have something for it to overwrite. Um, and there we go. It's, it's overwriting my colors now um, that I had on there. And that's kind of annoying. You might say, well, this is a reason not to use a descendant selector, but I disagree. I actually think it's fine to use descendant selectors, but it's important to know that you could have these potential impacts. And scope is something that we're going to be able to use to potentially prevent these types of issues. So one of the ways we could do that is instead of saying primary navigation like this, I could instead say at scope and in here do my primary navigation. And then I could have my A selector. Let's just do this. There we go. And then we get the A on its own like that. And that actually fixes my issue that I had. And there's other ways you could use your where selector or something as well to reduce the specificity. Uh, but we're going to see that we can do a little bit more with this. Uh, but basically what this is saying is we're saying any link that's inside of primary navigation will get these styles. But the advantage is this is only an element selector. So we're any link that's in my primary navigation. But as long as we have a class, that's higher specificity. So it's going to overwrite it. And we keep the, the color here on my subscribe button. So already I see that as a nice little win that we can have right there. But where this could actually now become problematic is if I did an A hover. And let's just say I change my color now to, uh, I don't know, purple, just so we have a different color on there. Uh, I probably wouldn't do purple because the contrast is really low, but that purple is now affecting my button. And the reason that purple is affecting my button is because this hover is counting towards specificity, All right, So we're boosting specificity. It's the same as a class selector right now because it's a pseudo class. 
And so it does that. I could wrap all of this in a where to prevent that from happening. But another thing that scope allows us to do is to say how far something is going. So I could say primary navigation, and then I could say to dot btn. And I don't personally think this is the best example, but as I said, I've just been playing around with um, scope styles recently. So I'm still looking for ways to use this to feature uh, in good ways. But you can see I, these are working, and then this one isn't getting the purple. And you know what? I'm going to change this to yellow just to make it more obvious that it's not working. So those are yellow, and this one is not yellow because this will go my primary navigation, any link. But as soon as we go to a button, it's going to stop and it will not go inside of that button. And it's not stopping at that point. So if I just move my blog link down to be after it, that blog link will still work the same way. So it's not saying like from here until here, it's saying scope that style for my primary navigation, but don't go inside of anything that has a class of button and style things that are there. So it sort of stops the styling at a certain point or a certain class as well, which is really, really cool. Again, I don't think that this is the right use case for it necessarily, but it could come in handy in the right spot. But I think we're gonna start seeing some, some more useful patterns come up with this where you can prevent styles not only being scoped to something, then prevent them from bleeding into descendants, which is really, really interesting, especially because we have that control. I don't have to put the two or the two could be an immediate descendant. It could be something that could potentially be six levels deep. It could be whatever it is. We're limiting where the scope of the styles are and that can be really interesting and have big impacts on how we write our CSS. And the other way we can actually use scope is let's actually take all of this off <laughs> Uh, and I'm gonna cut this here. And you may be going, that's kind of weird. So I have an on styled navigation. Uh, technically now what I could do is I can come here and do a style inside of this component or this, this thing. And I can put those styles with my at scope. And if I do that, those styles are being scoped. Now they will apply to everything because uh, I don't have the, the two in here, but those styles are being scoped to this that we have right here. So just to show you, if I take this out from here and I put it inside this LI and I paste it, so it's inside the first LI, the first LI is getting those styles and it's not applying anywhere else. Um, so <laughs> again, I wouldn't be using it in my navigation specifically in this way, but if you're working with components in a JavaScript framework, this could be really useful to just put a little scoped style tag within the element itself and know that the styles you're writing are scoped to that and it potentially could be a little bit more powerful because it's native CSS than uh, if you're using the, the actual scope styles that come with something like Astro Review. And there, there is definitely more to scope. I haven't done a video on it yet, but I am planning one where I'm gonna deep dive the topic a lot more, but I did wanna introduce it in this video just to give a quick overview of how it works, but it's definitely a topic that you could get into more. If you're watching this video in the future, I will link in the description to that scoped CSS video, but in the meantime, there are links to some articles that do go into more depth that are in the description. And so I hope all of this has given you a little bit better of an understanding of some of the modern features that we have. But of course, as I said, this was a quick overview of a lot of them. And I mentioned a lot of other videos along the way. So if you'd like to check out any of those videos, I put them all in a playlist that is right here for your viewing pleasure. And with that, I would really like to thank my enablers of awesome, Tim, Simon, Andrew, and Philip, as well as all my other patrons for their monthly support. And of course, until next time, don't forget to make your corner of the internet just a little bit more awesome.